we've seen that normal alkyl cations are planar. They're sp2 hybridized so that their empty orbital has as much p character as possible. As you can see from the top of this slide, empty orbitals prefer to have as much p character as possible and are most stable when they have as much p character as possible. But sometimes putting that empty orbital or making that empty orbital into a pure p orbital is just not possible. So consider the example of the atom mantle cation shown here. Because of the geometric constraints of this bottom ring, the carbon that's positively charged is unable to planarize. It has to be sort of bent out. This geometric constraint forces the empty orbital of that cation to be an sp3 hybridized orbital because the other three orbitals forming bonds to the rest of the molecule must be sp3 in order to exist in this geometry. This is slightly less stable than the pure 2p orbital because we've introduced S character, pulled that orbital slightly closer to the nucleus than the 2p orbital. What you'll see on this slide is that I've made the orbitals different sizes, and I've done this on purpose because as we move to more S character, the orbital gets pulled closer to the nucleus and there's less electron density farther away from the nucleus. In the case of cations, this is a destabilizing effect, which is the opposite of what we see for anions, which we discussed in the last video. Moving on to a vinyl cation, which is necessarily sp2 hybridized, we're placing positive charge, or leaving an empty orbital, as an sp2 hybrid orbital, introducing slightly more p character, and yet again, destabilizing. And finally, the sp hybridized cation, the alkynyl cation, is horrifically unstable and never observed because then we're at 50% S character, and that's way too much S character, an orbital way too close to the nucleus to exist for any appreciable amount of time. Any stray electrons that this orbital finds are going to pop right into it very quickly. A very important and unique factor in the stabilization of cations is the idea of hyperconjugation. And if you know a lot about orbital interactions, then the idea of hyperconjugation should be fairly natural to you. So we just saw that cations in their normal state, normal alkyl cations with three substituents, are sp2 hybridized, possessing a dp orbital. If there are filled sigma orbitals adjacent to that p orbital, we can get pi type overlap. So what you're seeing here on this diagram is pi type overlap between the filled sigma orbital in orange here towards the empty purple p orbital, or the sigma to a, as we call it, the empty atomic orbital of the cation. This donation effect stabilizes the cation and it explains why more substituted cations tend to be more stable. So if there are carbons here rather than hydrogens, so there are hydrogens on this diagram, but if the actual cation has more alpha hydrogen bonds like this one in orange, then there's more stabilization right, of the p orbital. There are more carbon-hydrogen sigma orbitals pushing their electron density towards that cation. And as a result, they stabilize it. This is why more substituted cations tend to be more stable. Hyperconjugation is the first in a series of what I call non-traditional resonance structures that we'll see. So, we can draw sort of a non-traditional resonance structure, or what's sometimes called double bond, no bond resonance, by imagining this sigma bond breaking and donating into a new pi bond. And the curved arrow there shows you this process. This new pi bond that forms leaves behind an H+, and it shows how, in a sense, the positive charge is shared between a hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom whose CH bond is donating in to the cation, and the carbon that's pos positively charged itself. The final factor that figures into the stabilization of cations is electronegativity. And I didn't mention electronegativity in the beginning of this, uh, of this lecture because it's not terribly important and it's something that I think is fairly obvious, especially if you've taken general chemistry in the past. But if you have it, don't sweat it. We'll take a detailed look at, at the effects of electronegativity right now. So the more electronegative atoms in the periodic table tend to be to the right 
and up, with fluorine being the most electronegative of them all. These atoms love to possess electrons and are very unhappy when they don't possess electrons. Thus, what we can say is that an electronegative atom will be less stable in its positively charged form than a less electronegative atom. So for instance, in the example you see on this slide, what we're looking at is a positively charged nitrogen against a positively charged oxygen. Because the oxygen is more electronegative, what we find is that it's more acidic than the nitrogen compound. Nitrogen is a little bit more okay with possessing that positive charge. Oxygen, not okay at all. As a result, oxygen wants to give up its proton, head back to the neutral alcohol form. Nitrogen, not so much. And for those of you who know about pKa, which we will talk about in a second, the pKa of a protonated amine is about Oh, 10 ish, and the pKa of a protonated alcohol is down in the range of 0 to negative 3. So you can see the oxygen is highly acidic uh, compared to the nitrogen by about 15, 10 to 15 orders of magnitude. So now let's switch gears a bit and start talking about how to quantify acidity. Quantifying acidity can be useful. We don't talk a lot about numbers in organic chemistry, but if there is one number related to organic chemistry that you should keep in mind, it's the number pKa. pKa is so important and so essential because the process of acidity is central to so many reaction mechanisms that we'll study. So what I wanted to do now was go through just a very short derivation of pKa, where it comes from, and its importance. Most importantly, how we apply it to mechanistic and reaction-based problems in organic chemistry. So what you see at the top of this slide is the equilibrium of an acid dissociating, going from HA, which you see right here, towards its dissociated components H plus and A minus. And if HA started out as cationic, then we would treat A as neutral on the dissociated side. The ideas are the same. I just happen to pick a neutral acid for this particular derivation. If you took general chemistry, you know about the equilibrium constant, which is a measure of the tendency of a reaction to go to products at equilibrium. It's products over reactants. If we write that out for the process of acidity shown here, we get this expression for Ka that you see, H plus times A minus over HA. Now, if we take the negative log of both sides of that, we get the expression shown below. So taking the negative log of both sides, that's called the P operation. That's why Ka transforms into pKa, and that's why I've essentially taken everything here and taken the negative log of it. Now, we can separate this out based on the rules of logarithms, and the final equation that we get is here in the bottom. And I'll get out of the frame and let you look at that for a second. This relationship is a very important relationship between pH, pKa, and the concentrations of species and solution. It's called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. In the next video, we'll take a deeper look at Henderson-Hasselbalch and talk about pKa in more detail.